Hi everyone. What Sarah didn't say as well is that I've had all of 25 minutes to prepare for this keynote. And, uh, but as the white middle class male in the room, you know, never pass up an opportunity to talk about your own opinions <laughs> is generally my learning. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for that last minute um, in, uh, invite. I'm very grateful, I think. I'm just going to set a timer. Um, so hi, yeah, I'm Tim and I'm a coach. And uh, what does that mean? It means I help people and teams and organisations look at what they do and look for the opportunities to do it better, faster, cheaper, more successfully, scale it, whatever. It's a fascinating job and I work with lots of different people. And about five or six years ago, I found myself working with a lot of professional women and a lot of professional men. And after a short time, I realised that all the women that I was coaching were facing lots of obstacles that my male clients weren't facing. Now, all the women in the room will be, will be go, yeah, yeah, we know all that, but as the white middle class male in the room, this was kind of new. I'm, wow, this is really interesting how society and professional culture is conspiring against you in a way that men not only don't have to deal with, but they have completely no awareness of. So just through sort of due diligence, I thought, well, I really need to research this. I need to get my head around this. So I very quickly became the best red feminist that I know, and, uh, which was quite unusual. And still to this day, I meet lots of people who identify as feminists, and I run lots of books by them, and they're like, no, no, I haven't, I haven't read that. And I'm like, damn, I wanted to have a good conversation with you about that. And now I can't. Um, but at the same time, there was this rising voice around diversity and inclusion. So it was a real interesting opportunity. Um, I thought there's an opportunity here to really you know, put myself behind something which has got genuine invention. And I was looking at what all the diversity and inclusion kind of initiatives were doing and I realised there was a lot of campaigning. And there was a lot of people raising awareness. But there wasn't anyone drawing route maps. There was no one saying, this is broken and this is how you fix it. A, B, C and D. And I thought, okay, this is somewhere where I can go and sit down, where I don't have to put myself in the white guy role, like, hi, I'm doing a blog about diversity and inclusion, can someone give me an MBE, please? I want to actually go and do something which has got nuts and bolts and that I can share. So I started researching all sorts of different ways in which we can manipulate human beings in a variety of relationships to optimise them for doing different things. And I looked at establishing uniforms in all our workplaces, changing the way that we have dialogue, even doing, looking at things like male chastity. Anyone aware of male chastity? Put it into your Google, but make sure it's not safe for work, okay? But a rising culture of how you can control men, because we all know you can control male hearts via their stomach, and how do you control their brain? I'll let you fill in the blanks. Um, and that's what that's about. But this McKinsey report came out about diversity in 2015 that really sort of lit a lot of conversation up. But I recognised that even the opening line of the report had a massive flaw in it. It said, uh, we know intuitively that diversity is good for business. Now, what do we actually know intuitively? We know nothing intuitively. We just feel. And then I read the report and there were lots of other stats that sort of said, you know, if you've got a diverse board, then you might be 13.5% more likely to be in the top 33% of companies in a top 25%. I thought, this is not good enough. I can't write something out of this. And I agree with it. I think it's true. But I need to actually feel like I can prove it. And all these companies that McKinsey had looked at, more than likely, they had diverse boards because they already had good culture. So what does that mean for the companies that have bad culture and think that they can just hire people and put people in a place and expect all of a sudden for their company to suddenly sprout new life? You just put good bricks into a bad wall. It's still a weak wall. So I really thought I was thinking about how do I can get into and invent something and what isn't being done. And I came across this psychological profile called Groupthink. A lot of you have probably heard of Groupthink. Um, and it's, an, it's a maligned psychology and often people talk about it as 25 white guys in a room that agree with each other and that's kind of a very pop and kind of cartoon caricature of what it is because groupthink starts with self-censorship okay so you've all experienced this maybe you've gone to a house party and the only person that you knew at that party was the host 
And he went in a bit nervous, going, oh, I'm not really going to a party with not knowing anyone. And the host brought you in and introduced you to someone in the kitchen, and you had a glass of wine, and you politely stood there and chatted. It's not until someone steps forward and gives you a shot of tequila and grabs you by the hand and pulls you up on the table and says, we're dancing right now, that you really get into the group. So you go in there with your volume on low and someone has to turn you up. It needs other people to turn you up. And I thought that's really fascinating that you know, this first part of groupthink, I'm going to do myself a disservice because I'm going to go in there quiet. And I don't want to go in there noisy because I don't want to tell everyone, here comes the egotistical prick who thinks he's really entertaining. But how do I find that balance of making sure that someone enters my collaborative space and I can optimise them to immediately be sharing, immediately having great ideas. And I thought, this is where there's an amazing opportunity. And I discovered the work of a guy called Elliot Aronson, who is a, quite a famous psychologist. And he was a man employed by the American government to solve the segregation. And he'd been taken into US schools because there was so much violence going on throughout the segregation. And he went in there, and really all the American government wanted him to do was to solve the violence. But he went in and observed the classrooms. And he found that the minority students who were slowly being integrated in the schools were at a massive disadvantage because they hadn't been in the schools yet. And they were often going into classes of white students who'd been there for five years. And so they were naturally taking themselves to the back of the room and sitting in the corner and trying to, to duck out of things. And because of that, teachers were sort of forming silent contracts with them. They kind of went, you know, oh, well, uh, I know you know the answer to this, but I'm not going to ask you because I don't want to embarrass you. And so they isolated these children even more by actually being empathetic with them. But what happened was when they got out into the, the schoolyard for recess, the white students thought they were idiots. And so there was goading and then there was violence. And so Elliot Aronson, being a very lovely man, realised that this was actually the reason behind it. And so he created something called jigsaw learning, which forces collaboration from people. So he would take six students, mixed ethnicity, mixed gender, he'd give them a book and he'd say, right, you're going to read chapters 13 and 25 you're going to read chapters seven and three to the whole group, and they would have to build a book report together. They couldn't advance or get scored unless they put that report together. And overnight, people suddenly realized they all had equivalent intelligence, and they were able to advance together, but they could only advance if they went together. And I thought, that's amazing. I need to do something with this. So I created a collaboration structure that I've called Breathe, which is kind of like the workplace version of um, jigsaw learning. And it allows me to take up quite a big room full of people. Excuse me, I'm just checking my timer. Take, take a large room full of people and generate ideas and consensus um, and pressure test and do all these sorts of things. And when I'm doing that, I'm trying to uh, create the best conditions for inclusion. And a lot of the inclusion rhetoric has us say that we kind of need to set up relationships where we go, hey, you, you're cool and I'm cool. Let's take time and we can both be cool together. But actually, we know that the workplace doesn't work like that. In fact, the workplace often feels like a gun in the face. Most of the time, it does. And so under that pressure, under the lack of time, lack of budget, lack of skills, lack of team, we always short our relationships. And so... This diversity training that kind of says, let's be cool, it doesn't work like that. And so I have gone the other way with the structures that I have, and I make sure that everyone has a gun in their face, not just the people who don't feel confident, not just the people that are minorities, not just the women, the white middle class males do too. So in my process, you have to share. If we need to come up with ideas right now, you don't get to not have an idea. You have to have an idea. And guess what? You're only getting one minute to come up with it. And then you have to negotiate your idea via another person, just one person. But you've got two minutes to negotiate it against each other. And so you have to have a little bit of a fight there, but you're only fighting one other person. And then you take it into groups. And the process, I, I've realized that if we flip the paradigm and make it more aggressive and more violent, not actually aggressive and violent, but actually go on the other side of things, we actually create more fairness. We make everyone work harder. So that's what I've been doing for quite a while. And I would love to show you or get you to work with me 
on one of the structures that I train people to do that creates inclusive dialogue. Would you be willing to do that? Cool, because you know I've got like one minute left, <laughs> and you're going to need to work fast. Okay, so when you're having an inclusive dialogue with someone, it's really important that that person feels understood, and that when it's your turn, that you get the chance to feel understood too. Okay, we do this by asking people questions, and we start those questions with the with the, with the word how or what. So the exercise you're going to do, you're going to get into pairs. And one of you is going to be the interviewer, one of you is going to be the interviewee. The interviewer is going to ask the interviewee a series of questions that only start with the word how or what. Only how and what. Not why. Why is a challenge. Okay? So if I ask you why you wore that shirt today, you immediately go, hang on, what's he seen? Oh, what am I doing? How or what? So an example, if I ask you what's your favourite film and you were to say Star Wars, I might say... What's your favourite episode? How many times have you seen it? What's your favourite character? And instead of me sharing my experience or jumping into your story and sharing my anecdotes of what about what I think about Star Wars, I'm just spotlighting you and I'm getting you to answer questions about who you are and what your story is until I feel like you're understood. Does that make sense? So I want you to work with your partner and actually just keep asking them questions about the subject that you're on until they feel understood. And I'll give you one minute each. You cool? Is that all right? So I also like you to meet someone that you've never met before right now. So it's all brand new news. Okay, get yourself into pairs. Has everybody got a pair? So who is going to be the interviewer? Hands up. Who's going to be the interviewee? Hands up. You've got one minute, starting from now. Okay, thank you. One minute's up. Flip the rolls, so switch. You've got one minute from now. Okay, everybody, time's up. Oh, that's great. Can I have your attention back in the room, please? I promise I'll go soon. You can carry on talking in a minute. I'm failing. Hi. You see, you're all so interesting, right? How difficult is it to hold someone else's story as the most important thing you're talking about? How many people, put your hand up if you struggled to find a question, if your mind was racing, like, what question do I ask? 
Our brains are playing tricks on us all the time and they're saying, where does my story jump in here? It's not about your story, it's about their story. Okay, so ask how and what questions. I promise you, if you're in the dating scene and you're having a bad first date, <laughs> how and what the person, okay? If you're hiring someone, how and what them until they're out of the door, okay? But make sure that your story isn't as important as theirs. Thank you very much.